Now, if I had to, I want, I want to start, I always want to, to come out of the Scripture, and I'm not using a lot of Scripture on my points today. Here's where I'm coming from in the Bible. Jesus' disciples said to him one time, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Right? Teach us to pray. It is in Matthew, you're right. And Je- Jesus, I-, I have an idea that they probably had overheard Jesus praying. And when they overheard Jesus praying, they said, teach, teach me how to do that. Like, that, that conversation you were just having with the Father right there, that, that connection you had with God, sh- show, me, show me how to do that. I want to know how to do that right there. And so here's where I'm at. Here's where I'm at. I'm, today I want to say I don't have all the answers for sure, but here's some things I've found helpful because there are times where it's just, we're just repeating words. By the way, Jesus gave us the Lord's Prayer, not just so that we would every single time repeat those specific words, but to give us a template, to give us a framework in which to talk to the Lord, okay? A, a framework in which to do that. And so today, I want to give you some, I want to give you some ideas for freshening up your prayer life, all right? It's for, for making a, a, a fresh time with the Lord. All right? If you're taking notes, you've got a handout with you there. You're going to find some of these things. All right? Number one, put resources. Put resources toward it. Anytime you want to revitalize something, anytime you want to, to, to re-energize something in your life, you're going to have to put resources toward it. I can promise you that. I... I um, I know that whenever it's time to revitalize something in my life, no matter what it is, I'm going to have to put time, okay? I know I'm going to have to put time resources toward it. Those are some of the things that we have to put into things. I'm going to have to put probably money toward it at some point. You have to put effort, yeah. You have to put emotional resources behind it, right? Um, You're going to have to put effort, so willpower resources, right? We're going to have to... We're going to have to lean into and put effort, put resources into, into prayer. I can say, I can say with 100% confidence right now that you have the energy, the resources in your life to have a vibrant prayer life. 100% sure that that is true. It might just be that all, of the, all that you lack in when your prayer life gets stale is a redirecting of those resources toward prayer. In other words, it may be that something else needs to go in order to make room for the time I need to pray. Or something else needs to not happen to make room for the, the emotional effort. Some drama's got to stop over here. Something that drains me emotionally has got to stop over here so that I can have the resources, the emotional reservoir necessary to direct that toward prayer. Something has got to change. Something's got to shift and when you've got to put resources toward it. And so I can promise you this. There's enough in your life right now to have a vibrant prayer life. I'm sure of it. It may be, though, that this is a good moment while we're in this prayer emphasis as a church, as a connection of churches. It may be that this is a good moment to redirect those, those resources that God has already placed in your life and turn them toward prayer. There's lots of places I could come out of in the Scripture to talk about that because you and I both, we, we, just, we all know it's true. It's true. You've got to turn resources toward it, all right? So what kind of resources do you need to turn toward prayer? What kind? Well, we talked about some of them, emotional resources, time resources, money, effort, willpower, those kinds of things. New life comes from new focus. New life comes from a new focus of energy. Number two, number two, sometimes you got to find new words. When Jesus was teaching on prayer in Matthew, he said something that's really interesting. He said, when you pray, don't be like the heathen people, the pagans, 
who just babble on, who just repeat the same phrases over and over and over and over again in hopes that one of those phrases might punch through, right? They have a, a wrong concept of God. They have a wrong concept of God as one that is either hard of hearing or distracted or you have to uh, say it the right words or the right magic word or the right word enough times until maybe one of them gets through and God hears you. As if God didn't hear you the first time you said it, right? Or as if God wasn't a father who was really interested. I'll be honest with you, I am a distractible person. But then you already knew that, if you've been around for any length of time. And I frequently have to say to my wife, okay, uh, sweetie, I know you just said something to me, but I was pulling my brain out of whatever it was I was thinking about, and I have no idea what it was you said. <laughs> and she has to repeat it over again, right? And I see some husbands and wives poking each other and looking at each other, and I know that that's an, I'm not the only one. All right, that's good to know that. I, I want to know, I want to know what is what is it that, that, that you, when, you're, when you are coming to the Lord in prayer, I want to know, what is it that you think God is like? Here's what I'm saying, okay? When you come to prayer, this is what God is like right here. All right. I, and I, I'm looking at you in the eyes because, because when I lean in just a little bit and I, I have my eyebrows up a little bit and I'm leaning in, and I'm, my eyes are, I'm making eye contact with you, you feel like I'm waiting for you to say something, right? Like you feel like I'm listening, like I'm 100%, I'm here, I'm present, I'm tuned in, I'm ready, I want to hear what you have to say. And what I'm trying to tell you is this, that God is like that every time you pray. I don't know if you've ever pictured God this way before or not, because a lot of times our earthly dads are like me. And my little boy has to come up and go, Dad, 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 about ten times before I say, what, 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 what? But there's never been a time that God was like that. Ever. Every time you come to prayer, God is waiting to hear what you have to say. It's not just empty words. It's not just empty forms. He is waiting on you. So when Jesus says, don't be like the pagans and just repeat the same words over and over again, how many of you know that you can get in a groove to where all you have is the same kind of the same words over and over again, and you're not, I'm not sure if our heart engages or not. You know what I'm talking about? And I think that's what Jesus is saying, that don't just use the same words over and over again as if somehow that's going to magically, I used the same words yesterday and today and the day before that and the day before that, and six weeks in a row and bring magic, God. No, no. Sometimes just finding new words, new ways to talk to God, new, new ways to connect with Him. We know this is true in our relationships because um, if you say the same things to your wife every single day, guys... Uh, after a while, it doesn't quite have the same ring to it, does it? You say the same words over and over again. Now, I love you is great, right? And you should say that and say it often. You should not do the whole thing where it's like I told you once 20 years ago, and if I ever change my mind, I'll let you know. <laughs> no, don't do that. But I am saying that, that new ways to express that, new ways to say that is enjoyable and delightful and pleasing, isn't it? Right? In the same way with the Lord, finding new words. Let me tell you something about your brain. Are you ready? Your brain has two parts. It has this big frontal lobe up here across the front, the, the prefrontal cortex, all right? The big part of your brain up here. This part of your brain is responsible for your thoughts and willpower and decision-making and critical thinking and language is all up here. Okay? And then there's another part of your brain that's closer down to the stem of your brain, and it's responsible for automation and thoughts that you have often and habits and um, gr just like the groove you get into and things you've done a million times before. You get into your car and you start it and put it in reverse and you back out and you spin the wheel and you don't, like, you don't think about, okay, 
okay, got to turn this way. You don't, you don't think that because it's, your brain has moved it down into this part of your brain. What happens is when you think a thought for the first time, it's up here. But if you think a thought often enough, your brain finds that and recognizes a pattern and says, oh, to save energy, I'm going to move it down into this really efficient part of the brain that doesn't have to think about it anymore. Now, if you're not careful, that can happen with prayer. And your brain can roll off things without even thinking about and engaging the words that you're, thinking, that you're saying. I can repeat to you people that I used to pray for when I was 10, 11, 12, that age right there. I had a list of people that I knew that I prayed for, and I prayed for them every day. And I can still tell you, Derek's dad, Buck's son, Terry, Tommy, Todd, Brock, Carl, okay? Like, I, could, like I prayed for those same people. And by the way, a bunch of them got saved, which is really cool. But they were people that needed the Lord, and I got them on my heart for some reason as a kid and started praying for those people. And I can still roll that off today, like, blah, 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 just run it right through my mouth. Why? Because it's stored in habit. What about when your prayer life gets stale? Maybe it's because it's like it's just down here and you need to find new words, right? You need to re-engage the part of your brain that makes you different from all the animals, right? That makes you personable, makes you a person with the Lord. Now, let's, let's continue on. I'm going to give you the blanks, right? The bottom line is your brain starts conserving energy by finding words you use regularly and putting them in the habit section of your brain. How many of you ever prayed this one? God is great. God is good. Now we thank Him for our food. By His hands we all are fed. Give us, Lord, our daily bread. Amen. Anybody pray that when you were a kid? Yeah. We can run right through that because it's stored down here. And so if you're not careful, you can roll it off without ever turning your heart toward the Lord. All right. Let's keep going. Fill your mouth with new words to re-engage your brain. And the best way to find new words is to borrow someone else's, right? I agree with that. I think it's true. I, I find sometimes that borrowing a song is a beautiful way to find new words. Here's my everything. I give you every part of me. I surrender my plans, my hopes, my dreams. You're so amazing. Makes me wish I had more to bring. But if you'll take it, here's my everything. What do you do? You reach back and grab that. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. What are you doing? Borrowing somebody's words, right? And bringing them into my prayer life. There's a lot of ways to do that. Borrowing somebody else's words, finding new words. By the way, this uh, little prayer book, that's why, that's why I did this. I did it for me. Yeah, actually, I didn't do this. I didn't do this for our church, and I didn't do it for the Bible Methodists. I, I did it for me. And the reason I did it is because I wanted to put something together for me that re energized my prayer life. I put time and emotional and effort and, and money into making this for me, and then I decided, you know what, if this is a blessing to me, maybe it'll be a blessing to somebody else. And then it just kind of went from there. But I, I, I love to. O oh, merciful and compassionate one, forgive us our iniquities, offenses, and transgressions. Do not count every sin of your servants and handmaids, but purify us with the purification of your truth. You know what those words are? That's Clement of Rome in 96 AD, almost, almost, a thousand, almost 2,000 years ago. And I just borrowed somebody else's words. Oh, God, help me turn my mind, turn my heart toward God. Now, I'm going to keep going because if I don't, I'm going to run out of time, all right? Let's keep going. Number three, make it all about God again. Number three, make it all about God again. What does that mean? Um, Here's what I mean by that, that when, when you get a new vision of God, there's new energy in your life. A fresh vision of God gives fresh energy, fresh purpose, fresh joy, fresh excitement, fresh awe, fresh wonder, fresh fear of the Lord, fresh gladness in Him, fresh thoughts about Him. When you turn your heart back to God, if we're not careful, if we're not careful, prayer can kind of bend inward 
and become all about me and all about my thoughts and my needs and kind of the things I'm doing today. And now those are not wrong, but it's possible that it can become all about me. And honestly, let's be honest, you're not interesting enough to keep yourself happy forever. I'm not either. I'm not interesting enough to keep me happy forever. I need to, I need to bend back my prayer and focus it back on the Lord because that's, and by the way, Jesus taught us to do this. He said, when you pray, pray like this, our Father who's in heaven, hallowed be your name. What's it? Holy, rev- revered, awesome, glorious is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What, what are we doing? Reaching out and starting by making it all about God. It's all about Him, who He is, and contemplating Him. Number four, number four, ask largely, ask largely. Ask largely. Oh, help me, Lord, to be able to communicate this, please. Could it be, if you're taking notes on your handout, could it be that you're not asking for anything that makes your heart beat faster? (laughs) <laughs> Let me just back up and try this again. Could it be that you're not asking for anything that makes your heart beat faster? <gasps> anything that's so big that if God doesn't do it, it's never going to happen. It Could it be that we are so stuck that one of the reasons your prayer life feels stale right now is because you're not asking God for fresh things. You're just kind of asking Him for the same, oh Lord, uh, help me have a good day today and uh, not to have any wrecks on the way to work and uh, traveling mercies and the food that I eat today and those without which it wouldn't be possible. Amen. All right. Like, could it be that you're just kind of running through a series of phrases and not asking for anything large. Lord, help me to do this well. Years ago, years ago, my, my family um, had a need, and I asked God to meet that need, and it wasn't something that I could do, frankly. It wasn't something I could do. Um, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you what it was. It was a vehicle. It was a car. And I had loaned a car to a friend who was irresponsible and blew the engine. And that was not the way I saw that going. And all of a sudden, it was going to be a bad business. It's going to be a bad thing. And all of a sudden, the Lord, through a series of circumstances I can't explain to you right now, opened up doors, and God provided a vehicle, provided a minivan. Our family was getting bigger at that time. And we bought a red Dodge Caravan minivan that the Lord brought along, and I got a ridiculous deal on it, ridiculous. And God supplied our need. And I saw that. I said, oh, Lord, thank you. That's beautiful. And we drove that vehicle, drove it until it had over 200,000 miles on it. And it was getting too small for our car, for our family, again, which is like a recurring theme in my uh, life, basically. (laughs) So... As I drove this car, and now I'm praying, Lord, you, you're going to have to supply this need. And the Lord opened up a door, and, and I bought a Buick LeSabre that was just a ridiculously good deal. And on paper, it looked amazing. The problem was I, I sold the van, I bought this LeSabre, and every seatbelt was full. And I was gonna, we were having another baby in a month, a month and a half. Okay, well, by the time this happened, it was a month, yes. So two month, two months out, we were having another baby, and I'm, trying, I'm getting ready to sell this vehicle, and I, take it, I took it on a trip and drove to my parents' house in Kentucky. I got there, and while I was getting there, uh, while I was on the way, it started overheating. 
And I thought, oh no. And I looked and it was low on water. And I thought, oh, okay. So I put some coolant in it and topped it up and drove for a ways. Um, drove it for a couple of days and it started overheating. And I got down and looked underneath and there's no water on the ground. My water, was, my coolant was low again and there was no water on the, on, the, on the ground underneath it. And those of you who know cars know that's not good <laughs> because it's going somewhere and it ain't going out of your engine. It's going in it somewhere. And I'm in Kentucky. I'm 14 hours away from my house and I'm out visiting family for Thanksgiving. And I, so I tore into the car and tore it down, discovered the lower intake manifold seal was, a, was usually what failed on these cars. And so I tore it down. I'd never been that low in the engine before. I'm seeing inside valves and stuff and seeing lifters and <laughs> scaring myself. And uh, I put the lower intake manifold seal back in there and put it all back together again. And it shot it right back full of antifreeze again. I said, oh, no. So I took everything back apart again and put Permatex to seal everything and put it all back together. I said, maybe this is just not, maybe I didn't get it right. And I, see, I put everything back together again. And it shot it full of antifreeze again. And by this time, it is Friday night at 1 o'clock in the morning. And I am feeling about that tall. I mean, I could sit on a curb and dangle my feet. I am not feeling very big. It is bad. It's a bad moment. Because i got to preach here on Sunday. And my family's stuck there. I'm stuck here with Noah. And I went and rented a car, and Saturday morning, I left early Saturday morning, driving down Rogers Lane in Kentucky, and I literally was pounding on the steering wheel because there's nothing to revitalize your prayer life like a uh, crisis. And I'm literally pounding on the steering wheel and said, God, if you've got a plan, you better show me what it is because right now I've got a car that won't run and I'm driving out to, to, to Oklahoma City to preach and then drive right back to Kentucky and try to figure out why this car won't run. And if it won't run, I can't sell it. If I can't sell it, I can't buy a car. And I got a baby coming and I don't... Aren't you glad God hears in those kind of moments? <laughs> I got back, figured out what was wrong with the car. We got it fixed and got the engine all dried out and got back to Oklahoma City. Rock solid on the coolant, not a drop going into the engine. Got back here. And when I got back here, I still felt pretty low, honestly, because now I've got to be honest because I've got that whole Jesus thing going on and I've got to be honest about So whenever somebody asks me and sell the, about selling this car, I'm going to have to tell them, uh, just you know, had this situation, but it looks like it's fixed. And I'm afraid, like, I'm not going to sell it for much. And, and God miraculously, through some friends and some, some, some of his people, sent, literally sent in money. We got a check that, that and between that and the trade-in value of that car, literally walked away from that moment with, walked away from that moment with the car, and the taxes and tags within $50 of what it cost to do that. And God supplied my need. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes you just need to ask bigger. You just need to ask larger. Because maybe the last thing that God wants you to do is just ask Him for one more good day. And more and more, you know, Lord, just help me have a nice day today. Maybe God's at, maybe maybe the thing you should do is Lord Lord show me something great that I could ask you for, show me something amazing, and maybe it's not even just your own needs. Maybe it's the salvation of your family and the changing of heart of some people you know and some coworkers at, at, and some people in your apartment complex or on your street. Maybe it's the revitalization of your church. Maybe it's the salvation of your kids. Pray for something big. Ask God for something large. It. it don't just ask for small over and over and over again. Ask him for something big. Let your heart beat one more time, all right? Number five. Whew, I spent longer there than I meant to. All right, number five, deal with sin. Number five, deal with sin. All right, if you are down in your prayer life, listen to me, this is important. Either sin will kill prayer in your life or prayer will kill sin. 
Okay? Either your prayer life will kill sin in your life, or sin in your life will kill your prayer life. All right? One of those two things is going to happen. So if I, if I cherish iniquity in my heart, David said, the Lord will not listen. Okay? Now, he may hear your words, but he does not obligate himself to answer the prayer of those who cherish iniquity. So if there's sin in your life, going to God in prayer is a marvelous time to deal with that. If your prayer life is stale, it could be because in the corner of your heart somewhere, there's a stack of things you'd really rather not talk to God about. Am I making sense? The little thing, set of things, oh, this is, Lord, this is just my stuff over here. Let's not talk about that. Let's not talk about this stuff over here. Let's talk about something else. You know what? Your prayer life will get pretty stale because you can't be honest with the Lord. This is why when Jesus taught us to pray, he said, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, right? Because in prayer, if you this is not guaranteeing that every day you've got sin in your life and you need to be forgiven of. What it is guaranteeing is that if you've got something in your life, you need to have a place, you need to have a space in your prayer time to deal with sin. God, I have sinned in this area and that area, and I'm sorry, and I need your help. Don't lead me into temptation, Lord. Deliver me from evil. What's it doing? It's talking about the sanctifying influence of prayer, dealing with whatever it is that's between you and God. If there's something that clouds your relationship with the Lord, deal with it so you can revitalize your prayer life, so you can be honest with the Lord without having a stack of things over here in a dark closet you don't want to talk to Him about. Okay? This is a great moment to say something. If you failed the Lord, if you failed God, listen to me, this is important. If you've failed God, bring it out to the open and honestly admit it and deal with it. Your God is not waiting to club you over the head. He sent His Son and poured out His blood on the cross to forgive that sin. He's not waiting to beat you up. He's waiting to forgive you and empower you. The devil will try to convince you, you can't go talk to God about that because he doesn't love you anymore. The devil is a liar. Our God is gracious and kind and inviting and welcoming. He told you to ask for forgiveness. Why? Because he wanted to forgive you. That's why he did it. He didn't tell you to come ask for forgiveness so he could say, ah, try harder. No. He is gracious and kind and welcoming. He wants to be asked so that he can give grace to cover sin and grace to empower you to conquer it. Don't go to prayer without dealing with sin. All right, number six, number six, shake up your routine. Shake up your routine. All right, no, what am I talking about? Well, when it comes to getting into a little groove, groove is good. Groove and routine is good. It also eventually can be dangerous because it, it winds up that things that you always, always do, you don't think about anymore. You just kind of do it. How many of you thought about how to brush your teeth this morning? I don't, like, I just did it. You know, I did brush. I did brush. You don't, I don't think about how to brush. Let's see. I think they told me to make circles all the way around. Like, I don't think that anymore, right? You just do that because you've done it so many times. So you didn't think about brushing your teeth this morning, but if you're not careful, the prayer can get kind of humdrum, kind of routine, so you sometimes shake it up. Find a new place, a new resource, a new routine, a new time of day. If, you used to pray, if you're used to praying in the mornings, add an evening time right before you go to bed. If you're used to praying right before you drop with exhaustion into bed, uh, change it up and use your lunch hour, or use your morning break at work, or get up first thing in the morning and just just shut off your phone and don't check email until you've talked with the Lord for a half hour or 15 minutes or whatever. Shake up your routine. Find something you love and pair it with prayer. Okay, let me tell you, at one time I was wanting to shake up my prayer routine and I was wanting to re-energize it and I, I really enjoy iced coffee. 
Some of y'all, some of y'all don't uh, drink. You just drink real coffee. Okay, I drink iced coffee because I enjoy iced coffee. I don't like hot coffee particularly because I don't like hot drinks. But I drink iced coffee. I really like iced coffee. And my prayer life was feeling a little flat. And I said, you know what? I'm going to do something different. I'm going to change my place. And I, I started driving and pray. Okay, because I could. It was easier to shut things out for me uh, rather than sometimes when I pray. If I pray at the office or at the house. Kids are happening, or it feels like I've got, I'm always seeing something I need to do, right? And, oh, I got to do that. Oh, I got to take care of that. And it distracts me. And so I got in my car, and I'd go down to Dunkin' Donuts, and I'd buy me an iced coffee. And then I'd get out here um, on, uh, it was back when they were 99 cents. I was like you know, one of those sales, you know? And I would get on 89th Street, and I'd drive over till I got to May, and then I'd drive north to 29th, and I'd drive 29th over to Shields, and I'd drive Shields back down to 89th and back over here. And that, I'd just drive a box, and I'd pray for everybody inside that box and pray for people inside and ask God. So it was just a, sh- what is it? Just a, r- a shake up of my routine because I was getting flat. I was getting stale. Shake up the routine. Now, you don't have to do it that way. Maybe you can't, your daily schedule doesn't allow that. No problem. What does it look like for you? What does it look like for you? Find a new, shake up your routine. By the way, Jesus frequently went away by himself to pray. Right? He, he had a routine where he did that, normally speaking. But there are other times where he would pray together with his disciples. And he'd pray with them in, in, in John 17, one of those times and places like that. So shake up that routine. Number seven, number seven, pray the Scriptures. Pray the Scriptures. Yeah, pray the Bible. Pray the Scriptures. This is probably the single biggest tip that I could give you. I Honestly, when it comes to praying the, 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 the Scriptures... God has given you things to pray about. In fact, I would love to see this happen this year, that this book become a conversation because you pair it with prayer. Okay, so God spoke these words to you, like they are the words of God. 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is God-breathed. Okay, it came from the mouth of the Lord. And so, if that's the case, God literally speaks in this, in this book. Now, how about this year, you read this book and you turn it into a conversation? What am I talking about? Okay, literally, I'm going to open my book to Psalms, and I have not seen this yet. Okay, so I don't know what Psalm I'm opening to. All right, Psalm 14. Okay, here we go. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, their deeds are vile, there is no one who does good. Oh Lord, thank you for telling me what a fool is like. Please don't let me ever be that way. Like, I don't want to be a fool, I want to be wise. Make me a wise man. The Lord looks down from heaven on all mankind to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. Lord, that's a beautiful picture of you, thank you. It's me, I'm here. Lord, I'm seeking you. I'm seeking you. I, I want to be the guy. Find me. You're looking for a man that's, that's seeking you? Find me, Lord. Find me. I want to be that guy, kind of guy. All have turned away and all have become corrupt and there's no one who does, does good, not even one. Lord, I know that without you, nothing good is in me. Nothing. I can't do one good thing today without your help and I need you, so please help me. I know I know I'm going to go back to the old way without you. I know I'm going to mess this up. I'm going to trash my relationships today unless you help me. Please help me. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay, I'm going to stop there because I don't have a lot of time left. But I, you, can, you can make almost the whole Bible a conversation if you'll take the time to do it, especially the book of Psalms. If you want to do this, go to the book of Psalms and make that a conversation because it is absolutely fabulous. It will revolutionize your prayer life. And there's 150 Psalms. You could pray through this book of Psalms two times every year and never pray, almost never, pray the same thing twice. Like just, just if they're so, it's new all the time. It's always fresh. Pray the scriptures. Or if you're in the New Testament and you're reading, uh, you're reading stories, Lord, make me like that person. Lord, don't make me not like that person, right? There's a thousand ways to pray the scriptures. Pray this book. 
turn this book from a one-way letter into a conversation. It'll revolutionize your prayer life, I promise. Number eight, number eight. Use the power of a relationship, all right? Number eight, use the power of a relationship. I'm going to use this word, together. Together is one of the most powerful words in the English language. Absolutely, absolutely powerful. Let me tell you why. Because one person by themselves gets distracted real easily. But when you have two, you have partnership and accountability. So that's the reason, that's the reason why I want to encourage you, if you get one of these, get it and pray it with your wife, or pray it with your husband, or pray it with your kids, or pray it with your church family. Find somebody and just check in with them and say, would you do this with me? Would you pray together with me? Like, would you be with me on this? And let's make this a thing and a, a, a seeking God together. So get one of these, and it starts off with adoration, where it starts off with psalms, where it's talking, uh, uh, focusing on the Lord, because the Bible says to do that, right? Start with adoration, our Father in heaven. And then it goes on to the kingdom of God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and so focuses in on different aspects of that. And so every day, there's three or four pages of, of written prayers and scripture there and content to help guide and give you new words and old ancient prayers and, and uh, ones that are, 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 are beautiful. I want to encourage you to use that and just take advantage of it. Use the power of together. Do it with somebody, all right? Number nine, use someone else's structure to shake things up. And yes, that's talking about a prayer book. I don't care. Honestly, I don't care if it's not mine. But if you'll find a way to shake something up, right? If you want to buy somebody else's prayer book, that's not going to bother me a bit, I promise you. What I want you to do is find a way, find, if, if, you're, if you're stale, if you're stale, don't get satisfied. Don't get satisfied with stale. Don't get satisfied. There is a story, and I'll wrap up with this. There's a story of a man who uh, was, lived alone and was just kind of, uh, didn't have a lot of money. But he lived really frugally, and finally he had saved up, he had saved up some money, and he thought, you know what I want to do? I want to go on a cruise. So he, he did some research, and he found a cruise uh, liner that would uh, rent him a room, and he, he paid, he had saved up uh, $750. The problem was that the room that he got, and the, the cruise that he bought, was seven hundred and twenty five dollars and so he he bought the room and he only had twenty five dollars left so he went to Walmart and he bought crackers and peanut butter and cheese and he thought you know what I could I could make it for a week on this so he went down on the day and he got down at the docks and there was that beautiful cruise ship Oh, it was just absolutely amazing. He said, this is going to be a great time. He got on board and he went to his room and it was kind of small and not really much of a view, but he thought, well, I get to be here. I'll walk around on the deck and boy, he had a time. And he went back to his room and, and ate some, took some peanut butter and put it on crackers and ate it and drank some water and, and he, man, he, it was it, pretty good, pretty good. And he went back for supper after going around walking on the decks and seeing the beautiful ocean, and he went back for supper and he ate crackers and cheese. And it's pretty good. And the next morning he got up, he's a little hungry for breakfast, and he, well, he had some crackers and peanut butter. And he went out and he, that day he saw a whale. It was just, he was having a time. And he went back for lunch and he had crackers and peanut butter. And then he went out and had a good time walking through the ship and seeing the sights. And, uh, and then he went back for supper and he had crackers and cheese. And the third day of this seven-day cruise he was on, he got up and didn't think he'd eat any breakfast this morning. Didn't, crackers and peanut butter wasn't sounding the best, so he'd, I'm going to skip breakfast. And he went out and Lunchtime, he's pretty hungry, but man, crackers and cheese. Crackers get a little, a little stale. 
And he didn't eat anything the rest of that day. The third day he went out and he could not look at crackers and cheese one more time. He's like, I am, I, I'm just done. I can't do it. I can't do it anymore. So he went, he went back to his room and finally he thought, you know, I don't have any money left, but I'll bet if I offered to do some dishes, those buffets that I saw down there, and those restaurants, I'll bet they would probably let me eat at least one meal if I'd say I'd do the dishes for them all day. So he went down, he mustered up his courage, and he walked in, and he said, uh, Sir, I, I look at your buffet every day when I pass it, and I'm, I am really hungry. I haven't eaten anything all day, and I was wondering, if I did dishes for you, could you maybe let me eat from the buffet and I'll, I'll, just, uh, I'll just do dishes for the rest of for both meals today. And the guy looked at him funny and said, well, sir, did, did you buy a ticket? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I bought a ticket. I'm, I've got a right to be here on the ship. I just, I just can't eat peanut butter and crackers one more day. And the guy said, well, sir, all the meals on this ship and every restaurant on this ship is included when you buy your ticket. Now listen to me. <laughs> I think you know where I'm going with this. But if you're, if you're stale today, and you've been living on peanut butter and crackers in your spiritual life, and you've been kind of just barely scraping through, this is not the time. <laughs> this is a new year. I, I don't know if you know this, but there's something better than getting by on peanut butter and crackers for the rest of your spiritual life. <laughs> Jesus has spread a buffet. He has opened up the doors and he said, you bought a ticket and with, uh, with that comes the best spread I can put on for you. You have better things purchased for you already than living on peanut butter and crackers for the rest of your life. And if the story of your 2019 is barely getting by and barely scratching by on peanut butter and crackers, listen to me, Jesus has something better for you, so why don't we go into the presence of our great God and say, I'm here for everything you've got for me. Just point me to where the table is, because I want something fresh. <laughs> I don't want to live on last year's stuff. I want something fully, fully like God's got for me. Let's bow our heads together and let's seek Him in prayer together.